Like you said, my name is Melody O'Neill. I'm the Associate Admission Director. Um, this is my 26th year at Landmark. Been here a long time. <laughs> I worked as a teacher at the high school for a number of years um, in our expressive language program, um, teaching oral expression classes. And um, I also worked in the early literacy department um, doing the uh, Linda Mood Bell Lips early literacy tutorials. Um, and then for a number of years, I was an academic advisor. We used to call them case managers. So I had a case load of students. I oversaw their programming and um, wrote IEPs and all of that. And since 2006, I've been in the admission office. So I've um, done a few different things during my time here. also been involved with outreach, which is our um, professional um, development that we have over the summer for other educators. Um, so presented with that. Um, and in addition to the professional um, hats that I've worn at Landmark, I also am personally involved as a parent. My um, daughter did a number of summer programs here, um, and my son did a few summer programs as well, and he's a current seventh grader at our middle school right now. So um, I get to experience Landmark from the parent perspective as well, which is great. So that's a little bit about my background, um, and I think you'll hear from some of our other um, administrators that jump on the call that um, they've also been you know, a lot of them have been professionally involved for a number of years and personally involved with having children here as well. And um, so it's it's nice the the, the um, commitment from the faculty to just um, really, um, you know, love what we do, love these kids that are here and, and want to stick around for a long time because it's such an amazing community really comes through at Landmark. So. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. All right. So I'm going to get the presentation up and running. Just give me a minute. Um, let's see. If at any point during Melody's presentation, you think of a question that you're worried you might not be able to retain <laughs> until the Q&A, put it in the chat bar at any time and we'll make sure that we get to it. All right, Katie, how's that? We're good to go. Yeah. Again, use that push pin icon. Scroll to the center if it's not taking up the entirety, but hopefully it's looking big and clear for everyone. Um, I'll let you take it away. All right. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, all right. So the first thing we're going to do this morning is, um, as Katie mentioned, want to have a, a pretty detailed overview in terms of who our students are and what we do here in terms of the programming. So in, in trying to describe our student profile, the first few things that I wanna mention are that the students that come to Landmark are really bright kids. They have a lot of ability um, in terms of the big picture thinking and the problem solving and um, just a lot of potential um, to learn and they're curious and eager to learn. Um, but they aren't necessarily achieving at, at a level that's commensurate to that um, ability and to how smart they are. Um, the students come to us well adjusted overall. They may have had some, um, you know, uh, levels of anxiety or mild depression because of their academic struggles, but it's really a direct result of that. And we um, cannot really support students who have more primary emotional needs because we're not a therapeutic school. So the kids are really well adjusted overall. They're really motivated and capable. Um, and that resiliency piece is, is a pretty awesome part of the profile for the landmark student in that again a lot of them have really struggled in the past and despite those struggles um they've they've kept going and you know worked as hard as they could and um when they get into an environment where um they're around other students who learn like them with teachers who really get that language-based learning profile it's amazing to see the progress that they that they make but our students really are very capable and resilient um, in terms of that language-based profile, so when we talk about the students at Landmark having a language-based learning disability, we think of that here as kind of an umbrella term that can encompass a number of possible specific labels or diagnoses. Uh, and so through private neuropsych testing or public school psychoeducational testing, you've probably seen a lot of these specific labels used. Um, 
in the evaluations. So the dyslexia diagnosis, or as it may be referred to as an SLD, specific learning disability in reading, um, that's about 75% of our high school population that's pretty classically dyslexic in terms of having a phonologically based deficit that affects their ability for word attack, decoding skills, encoding, um, spelling skills, reading fluency skills, and of course that can then impact reading comprehension. Uh, a number of our students uh, that attend Landmark have a disorder of written language, or it might be again SLD, written language. Um, and you know that encompasses students who have a hard time getting out in an organized way what they want to say on paper. So they have all these great ideas, but that ability to plan and organize and execute um, and using grammar and mechanics and all of that for, for written output is a struggle. Um, we have a number of students at, at our program that struggle with aspects of language processing um, and specifically the expressive piece. So we really need for students to have pretty intact receptive language in terms of the comprehension coming in, what they can understand. Um, but then for a lot of our students, that specific word retrieval and output and oral formulation may be a difficulty. Um, and then in terms of the executive function piece, that's a very popular buzzword these days. Um, pretty much anybody who's going to struggle with aspects of a learning disability, it's going to impact areas of executive function. So when we talk about executive function here, um, you know, it's looking at that ability to plan and organize and initiate tasks, prioritize, knowing how to, um, let's say, uh, study um, for a, a big you know, test that's coming up and plan and organize and break down the information, knowing how to prepare um, and the steps involved for writing a research paper, knowing how to take good two column notes, previewing relevant vocabulary. All of those things are study skills that are connected with that executive function. Um, and I'd say pretty much all of our students have areas of struggle around that executive function piece. Uh, what we also see for the student profile here at Landmark is that the working memory and or processing speed oftentimes is, is lower than where that comprehension and, and reasoning and problem solving is. So that's oftentimes where we'll see a discrepancy. And I'm going to talk about the cognitive testing in just a minute. Um, but that ability to hold on to a lot of information at once that a student then has to do something with may be a struggle or that ability to quickly scan or motorically output um, could also be a struggle. Um, so again, you know, a lot of our students here do have dyslexia and struggle with reading, but we also have students sometimes at Landmark where they're pretty solid readers, but they may really be struggling with organization for written output in the executive function piece. So not all of the students here are, are classically dyslexic, but they all fall under that umbrella of a language-based learning disability. And that really is a very narrow piece of the pie. Um, you know, we're not equipped, as I mentioned before, to support students who have more primary social-emotional needs. If there's a therapeutic need, we're just, we're not uh, a therapeutic program. Or if a student maybe has more difficulties with that big picture thinking, you know, maybe if there's a diagnosis of ASD, which is autism spectrum, um, we may not be the best fit because um, we rely on that big picture thinking to be a strength for our student. Okay, so that's that's the profile. Um, and then also just tying in that cognitive ability. So in terms of uh, our application process and how um, we look at students when they apply, um, we work on a rolling basis. There's no deadline whether you're looking for summer program or school year. And our application is available online and there is a whole checklist of everything we need to receive. Um, part the, One of the most important parts of what we need to receive with the application is testing within three years. So it has to be, again, within three years of date of application. And specifically to look at the cognitive ability, we need to have the WISC, which is the Wessler Intelligence Scale for Children. Um, if a student is 16 or older, they probably would have had the WACE, which is the Wessler Adult Intelligence Scale. So it's, it's the same, essentially the same test, it's just the adult version. 
Um, and so again, with the landmark student, the areas of strength are, are surround that verbal comprehension, um, that understanding of language coming in, um, the fluid reasoning, which is the big picture thinking and problem solving, and then that visual spatial integration, which is if you kind of think of the architect, it's kind of seeing how pieces go together to make the whole. Um, and we're very visually based in the way that we teach here at Landmark, so we really rely on that visual spatial integration and again big picture thinking um, because we know that if if that's intact for a student they're really going to be able to access the curriculum here and make effective progress if that's a real struggle for a student um, then they would really struggle with the types of visual aids and templates and visual modalities that we use here um, and again where we typically see that discrepancy is with the working memory and our processing speed oftentimes being lower than those other areas of cognition Okay, so let's start to talk now about the specific programming at Landmark and what's really, you know, unique about us, what makes for a good language-based school and a language-based program. Um, one of the most important components of Landmark, who we are and what we do here, is this daily one-to-one -one tutorial that all students get if they require any level of literacy or language remediation. Um, Landmark was founded in 1971 with about 45 students at the time. So we've you know, reached our 50 year anniversary and um, we've grown a lot over the years. Um, we're now over 450 students total between the two campuses um, with about 300, you know, between 275 and 300 usually at our high school. Um, but this tutorial, has always been a key component of our programming. Again, the goal is to remediate language and literacy skills. Um, it's completely individualized based off a diagnostic of goals. So again, this, this curriculum is developed looking at areas such as the decoding, the reading fluency, the encoding, the reading comprehension, the written expression, um, the oral expression and the study skills. And we will figure out what each student needs to focus on and individualize that, that curriculum. Um, so no two tutorials look exactly the same. Um, of, a, of the 300 students that are typically attending our high school campus, there's usually 80 or 90 students who are in a very specific type of tutorial called the early literacy tutorial. Um, and these students are utilizing um, the LIPS program primarily. Now that's not to say we just use one program because we believe strongly that it's important to have more than one tool in the toolbox and that not one program is gonna work best for everybody. Um, but for these students, they come to Landmark and we've identified that there are pretty significant gaps in the phonological awareness piece still, um, that their word attack and decoding is pretty behind. So they will be doing a lot of um, this multi-sensory approach towards building that phonemic piece. Um, the LIPS program, if you've heard of things like OG Orton Gillingham or Wilson, again, these are all phonetic based <coughs> programs. Um, the LIPS program is probably the most multi-sensory and then it's utilizing a lot of what we call oral motor feedback and also a lot of manipulatives with felts and blocks for tracking. Um, and we find that our students do really well um, using this program. Um, so that's in the one-to-one -one tutorial. And for a student who comes to us who doesn't need the early literacy, maybe their decoding is pretty solid, but they need practice on higher level um, fluency and reading comprehension and writing skills, they will go into our traditional tutorial program, again, where we're tailoring their needs very specifically. But again, know that this is a 50-minute class that happens every day, Monday through Friday, just like all the other classes. Um, the classes here are all 50 minutes each. It's the same set schedule every day. We don't rotate. And this tutorial is happening during the school day. It's not before or after. It's not extra support. It's one of their regular classes every day. In terms of the classroom at Landmark, this is also really unique. So we have an average class size of six to eight students, sometimes as small as four. Um, and we're looking to place students in classes based on their ability level. 
So oftentimes in the admission office, we will get calls asking, you know, is our sophomore 10th grade class full or junior class full, for example? And that's not how we admit students to our school. We take students until we're full as a program or until all of our tutorial teaching periods are full. Um, so what this means is, you know, we're not taking 18 or 19 year old seniors and putting them with you know, 14 year old freshmen, but grade up, grade down, we're really more concerned with um, looking at the levels of literacy, looking at the working memory and processing speed, looking at the expressive language ability, and grouping students in their math class, in their history class, in their language arts class, with other students that are really um, at the same skill level, moving at the same pace as them. It allows for the teacher to really appropriately gauge the, the pace and the challenge level of the class. It allows the teacher to know how much homework these six to eight kids can handle in a certain amount of time independently at night. So we're really looking to, to again, place students based on ability level. If you think about language arts, for example, where the focus is written composition, it doesn't make sense to take a student who's struggling with basic sentence and paragraph structure and put them with someone who's writing multi-paragraph or multi-page essays just because they both happen to be in ninth grade. Um, so that's really important to us. Um, the other thing is that we are an approved program. Um, we have about 50% of our students that are placed here funded by local districts in Massachusetts and some even out of state um, receive funding. So we are following the mass curriculum frameworks. We're paralleling that in terms of students taking typical content high school classes that they would have at any public school. So, you know, they're going through biology and chemistry and US and world history and algebra and geometry. Um, Obviously, the delivery of instruction is very different within the small class and kind of teaching content through study skills so that they're learning how to preview relevant vocabulary and how to take a two column notes and how to study for tests. But the, the content is being presented um, in class instructionally by the teacher and it's being reinforced with the homework at night. Um, but we are, f are following that framework. Um, and our teachers here who are working with our students have a master's degree in mild to moderate special education, um, or they're currently working towards that through the DESE um, and being supervised while they're in process of receiving um, that higher degree. Um, about 70 to 75% of our faculty already have that, cert that higher level certification. In terms of our approach, what makes for a good language-based program is that it's skill-based, that we're working on direct and explicit instruction on how to develop skills through content. Um, so again, those things that I've mentioned, um, previewing relevant vocabulary and knowing how to plan and organize and break down information um, when it's a lot of information at once, how do you, um, you know, micro unit that information. The consistency across curriculum is so important in having an effective language based program. You don't want te each teacher teaching in a different way. You want consistency across curriculum in terms of the type of templates and graphic organizers and study guides and the approach towards writing and all of that because that's what allows for a student to then internalize skills and then to be able to implement these skills independently and for us to be able to start to remove some of that structure. Um, we do have three distinct programs at our high school at Landmark, um, and I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the Founders Program, the Expressive Language Program, and the PrEP Program. What I want to mention before I start to talk about these programs is that when you apply to Landmark High School, you just apply to the high school, and then while we're reviewing an application and looking through independent testing and then doing some of our own informal screening and assessments, that information helps us to determine which program is the best starting point for a student when they come to Landmark as a new student. And what happens sometimes during a student's 
stay with us during the years that they're with us is there might be movement within the programs as they gain skills and make progress. So it's not, I don't want you to think that a student, you know, starts in one program and they're slated for that one program during their entire time at Landmark. That's not necessarily the case at all. Um, we have students that are doing combination of programs as well. Um, but what I want to mention is that our high school is a college preparatory high school as a whole. Our students are college bound. We know they're bright and capable. So whatever program they're in, it has nothing to do with how smart they are um, or whether they're capable of going off to college because all of our students are. It really has to do with the skill sets that they have or that they don't have in place when they join us um, and, and to meet them where they're at with their skills and move from there. So the first program I want to talk about is our Founders Program. That is the largest majority of our students um, that are placed in this program. It's our traditional program. And so here's an example of the courses that the students would be taking within the Founders Program. They have a math and a science and a social studies class. Again, 50 minutes every day, five days a week. They have English language arts, of course, which is grammar and written composition. They have the one-to-one -one tutorial that I was talking about earlier. This may be a traditional founders tutorial or this may be an early literacy tutorial. Again, utilizing that LIPS program if needed. And then the sixth academic in their day, because there, there are six content academic classes in the day. Um, this is determined by us. Um, based on a student's needs. So if a student comes to us with real gaps in their literacy, they may have an additional small group reading fluency class on top of that one-to-one -one tutorial that they have. If they don't need the extra reading class, they may go into a study skills class or possibly a literature class if that's what we determine a student needs. So that that's their academic day and don't worry i will get to all the fun stuff in a little bit there is room for an elective in the day as well we want for the kids to have a break and to have an elective class and do something non-academic during the day that they enjoy doing we want them to pursue their passion so i will get to all of that um, the second program at the high school is our expressive language program we usually have close to 100 of the 300 students um, at the high school that um, are in our expressive language program. As you can see from the list of classes, it looks very similar, math, science, social studies, English language arts, one-to-one -one tutorial. Again, it can either be the traditional tutorial or the LIPS tutorial. The main difference for the students in the expressive language program is that their sixth academic class in the day is a class called oral expression because these students have been identified as having difficulty with word retrieval and output of language and the language processing piece in general. So in that oral expression class, these students are working on those strategies. They're working on the word retrieval strategies and the vocabulary development and the understanding of figurative language and multiple meanings and idioms and things like that. Um, so it's an extra language class that's in the day um, for these kiddos. Also, in terms of their written um, expression class, the, the, the um, language arts class, there's a bit more structure to that writing process for them. Okay, so that's that's the expressive language program. Um, and, and a lot of the students that are in the expressive language or the founders program, they don't even necessarily know they're in one program or the other. They're, again, they're, there's crossover and their schedules look very similar. Um, the prep program is the third program that's offered at Landmark High School. I'd say it's a little bit more different <laughs> than the other two. Um, so we usually have between 40 and 50 students full time in our prep program. And we may have another 30 students doing some type of combination of program where they might have one or two classes in the prep. So here's how I like to describe the prep program. So it's a little bit of a, a school within a school where the focus here um, and the design of this program is meant to be for students who no longer require daily one-to-one -one literacy remediation. As you can see from the list of classes here, there is no one-to-one -one tutorial for these students. These are the only students who don't get that one-to-one -one because they are reading at grade level. These students may not have a dyslexia diagnosis or they may have already had 
um, an amount of remediation in the past where they are now at a point where they are decoding and reading fluently, okay, at grade level. So these students still have math and science. Um, there's crossover with that with the other programs. There's no separate prep math or science. Everybody comes together for that. Um, but they do have a specific um, social studies uh, class within the prep. Their English language arts class is called grammar and composition. These students are expected to be able to handle a bit more in terms of the pace, volume, and complexity. And with writing, we want to see that the students in the prep program already have a good understanding of paragraph structure. They're able to write two to three paragraph essays already. Um, and so they're, they're expected to do a bit more in terms of that written output. Um, and then their other classes are a specific literature class and a specific study skills class within the prep. Um, so again, we know that they're reading at grade level. We know that they can handle a bit more in terms of the written output. So the pace, volume, and complexity increases. Um, and I do want to mention that the prep program is the only part of our high school that's not approved, meaning that if a student is getting funding from a local district, they cannot be in the prep program. Sometimes a district may allow for one or two classes in the prep, but the whole kind of purpose of receiving funding from a district is to have that one-to-one -one tutorial with the remediation, um, which is not part of the prep program. So I want to mention that. But I also want to mention that there is a high level of challenge that is available within the traditional founders program as well if a student is ready for that. Okay, so those are our three programs. Um, and again, we determine that um, when a student is accepted to Landmark. The study skills piece I've really mentioned already, but just to kind of spiral back and review, it really is embedded in everything we do. So whether a student is in a specific study skills class or not, they are getting support around study skills and they're they're getting this instruction of i mentioned before the two column notes um, how to preview the vocabulary the test taking strategies that five-step writing process of going from a brainstorm to an outline to a rough draft to an edit to a final draft using very specific templates so those skills are being taught across curriculum in everything that we do um, another thing that's unique about our programming at Landmark is this role of the academic advisor. So every student at Landmark, regardless of what program they are in, they have somebody who's overseeing their schedule um, and their classes. And this academic advisor is also working very closely with the one-to-one -one tutorial teacher to supervise that tutorial, to develop the diagnostic of goals, to go in regularly to observe and monitor progress throughout the year. Um, they write the IEPs for any funded students in their caseload. Um, they typically have a caseload of around 18 students. They do teach a couple periods a day as well. Um, everybody pretty much that works at Landmark, even our head of high school, our dean of students, they teach a period. Um, our, our dorm parents, house parents teach a couple periods. Everybody here is a teacher as well. Um, but they, they write the IEPs for any funded students in their caseload. And the other main role of the academic advisor is to be the main contact for the students and for the parents, getting updates on how things are going, the progress that's being made. Um, the academic advisor stays with the student during their years at Landmark, which is a really nice thing. Um, they get to know the students really well. The student gets to know their advisor really well. They develop a nice close relationship. Um, and again, that, that doesn't change year to year like other teachers would change year to year, but the advisor um, remains the same. So that's the role of the academic advisor. Um, the other important part of our programming here at the high school, of course, is the whole guidance and transition office and, and their programming and those folks that work really closely with the students. Um, even as early as ninth grade, they're doing transition planning and students are doing interest inventories and really thinking about directions they might want to go in and passions that they want to pursue at the post-secondary level. Um, starting junior year, uh, the students are assigned a specific guidance counselor that they will meet with weekly. Um, it's very personalized support throughout the whole process. Um, everything from, again, identifying what types of schools might be best. Is this a student that 
could still use a decent amount of support when they leave Landmark? Are they better off at a smaller college or university? Or is this a student who's ready to go to a larger college or university? Maybe they need very little to no support by the time they leave Landmark. So they're really involved with that whole piece of it. Um, and then requesting you know, the applications, getting the letters of recommendation, working on the college essays. Again, it's a very hands-on approach that we take towards supporting um, students through that process. And as you can see for this, the kids that apply, which is almost all of them, we have 100% accepted, typically around 94% um, attend. Sometimes students may decide to do a gap year or um, go into the military or a specific trade school, but um, the large majority of our students are attending um, two and four year and a lot of four year universities. So that's great. Um, and they're very successful because they've worked so hard to develop those effective executive function skills around, you know, the study skills piece, um, the writing piece, the test taking piece, the organization, the time management, and especially the self advocacy um, for the students to know who they are as learners, um, to know what they need um, to be successful and to be able to advocate for that is huge. So um, the last part of the academic and kind of school day that I want to talk about quickly is the homework. And then I want to talk about life at Landmark after school and all the extracurriculars and electives and all of that. Um, students are assigned homework every night. It's a direct review and practice of the skills and content that are being addressed um, in class. So we've really set them up to be successful, to feel that they can do the homework independently. It's very manageable. It's not a stressful um, you know, situation, the, the homework. Um, it does count as a big chunk of their grade, so it's important to be getting it done. Typically, underclassmen, ninth, 10th graders will have about an hour and a half a night. Um, as they move into junior, senior year, as upperclassmen, it may increase to a couple hours a night. Um, but again, it's always manageable. It's about 15, 20 minutes per class. It's always practicing what they've been working on um, during the day. So they're, they're very supported with their homework. Okay, so let's start to talk about after school. Um, we have an amazing residential curriculum for the students that live at Landmark. Um, and that's usually a third to, you know, a bit more than a third of our students. So, you know, of the 290, 300 students um, attending Landmark. We might have between 100 and 125 kids living here. Um, we have students from all over the United States. We have some international students from other countries. Um, so as I talk about the afternoon and evening, please know that if you are only considering um, day, the day program and sending um, your student as a, as a day student, we want the day students to stick around after school when school gets out at 3.15. 95% um, of our day students do stay. They participate in the afternoon activities. Um, that's an important part for them to feel connected with the community, to get to know more students. A lot of the day students will even stay for supper. They can be here three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, a lot of them will wait to head home until after rush hour traffic in the evening. So it's very flexible with our ability to support the day students and to have them on campus. That said, if a student has an hour or more commute every day, there are real, real wonderful benefits to being in residence during the week, to not having to deal with a long commute to and from every day, and then they can go home on the weekends. Um, so what happens after school here for the kiddos is that they, for the ones that live here, is that they have to do an afternoon activity. And again, I'll get into all of the choices um, of those in just a minute. Um, then there's supper. After dinner, there's an hour of free time for the kids to hang out with friends. Anything they want, they can watch TV, they can shoot hoops in the gym, they can work out in the weight room. There are a bunch of options of things they can do during their free time. And then from 8 to 9.30 every night is structured study hall. And that's when students who live here are at their desks in their room. They're working on homework. Teachers are assigned coverage in the different dorms. They're checking in regularly, asking the students how it's going and if they need any help. Um, and we do all of this through a level system. So we have six levels of support. And the goal of our residential curriculum and our level system is to really promote effective time management and organizational skills, 
and to build the self-advocacy and healthy decision making. Um, and so every new student that comes to Landmark, whether they're coming in as a freshman for ninth grade or whether they're coming in as a junior as a, for 11th grade, they will start off at level one um, and the highest level is level six. So every few weeks as a student meets the day-to-day -day expectations, being on time, getting out on time for breakfast, lights out on time at night, being productive during study hall, taking care of business, every few weeks that student can move up to the next level. And as they move up levels, they gain privileges, things like being able to have a fridge and TV in their room and a gaming system in their room and having being able to um, order food from local restaurants to be delivered and having a later bedtime. And so there's lots of flexibility that the students um, and privileges that the students gain as they move up the level system. Let's jump into talking about all of the amazing um, after school activities and electives that we have at Landmark. So we have a fantastic um, visual arts program with all kinds of 2D, 3D media art, drawing, painting, printmaking, ceramics, um, the digital art, the photography. These are all elective options during the school day and they are also afternoon activity options. If a student isn't doing a sport, they can be in the art building after school. We have an amazing performing arts department with chorus and dance and drama and theater tech and after school kids taking music lessons and working on uh, making costumes and there are a bunch of options there again as electives during the school day and as afternoon activities um, and we do a, a fall and a winter play production we have a spring musical that we do so it's, it's really a very robust performing arts department. In terms of our athletic programs, those happen after school. Um, we have the three seasons of JV and varsity sports. We compete with a, like a dozen other private schools in the area, or part of a league. So in the fall, the students can be participating um, in golf, soccer, um, cross country, and girls volleyball. In the winter time, we have uh, wrestling, we have basketball, swim team, and indoor track. Also, in the, uh, during the winter months on Saturdays, we'll go to local mountains for skiing and snowboarding, just recreationally for fun. Uh, in the spring, we have tennis, we have baseball and softball, we have lacrosse, we have sailing, and we have outdoor track. So a lot of um, athletic you know, opportunities here for the students and different sports for them to choose from. Uh, we have a working auto mechanics shop on campus where kids can take auto mechanics as an elective during the day or be in the auto shop after school. We have a woodworking um, program with woodworking and boat building. Again, they can take it as an elective during the day or be in the wood shop after school. And we have um, a Steamworks technology lab where there's their programming classes and animation and film production and uh, there's 3D printing happening after so all kinds of things going on in the technology lab. So um, that that's uh, an option as well. And we have a wonderful robust community service program here. Um, students are doing thousands of hours of community service every year. Um, all kinds of opportunities after school for them to get involved. And also um, there are trips that happen every year, service trips. We've done things in the past, like go to Jamaica and work at a school there. Um, we've taken service trips to, to DC. So um, there's all kinds of, of great opportunities for the community service at Landmark. So that kind of sums up our school year information. And what I wanna do now is take the next five minutes to talk about our fantastic summer program that we offer at Landmark. Um, we have typically day and boarding students. Um, this summer, I do want to point out that we are going to be a day program only. Um, with everything with COVID and the pandemic, we've kind of had our boarding program on hold this year. Um, we've had, we're very proud of the fact that we've had our day students attending Landmark since last August. We've been open and 
fully functioning in terms of that, but we have had the boarding program on pause. Um, our boarding students that live too far away to commute have been attending Landmark remotely this year. Um, and we're very excited to be welcoming them back for the 21-22 school year at the end of August. And in preparation for that, we, we need the summertime to just be fully prepared. So um, our summer program for this summer will be a day program only. Um, we offer programming at our high school campus for students entering grades 8 through 12. So it's a little bit different from the school year where we're grades 9 through 12. Um, we are supporting students entering grades in, in eighth grade for the summer. Um, and the way that the day works for our summer program is that the students will have four classes. They are an hour long each. Every student over the summer receives that one-to-one -one tutorial, that individualized programming with the tutorial. They get a language arts class, a math class, and then the fourth class that they will receive will be either a study skills or an extra small group reading class. Again, we will determine that based on a student's profile and an area of need. Then there's lunch. And then there is a structured study hall in the afternoon over the summer. There is some homework. It's not as much as the school year, but there's a little bit of homework. Um, so different from the school year where the study hall is at night for the students living here, um, over the summer program, it's in the afternoon. And we have options for students to just do the academic program, just to be here for classes only, and then leave at that point. Or students can stay for what we call an extended day. And then from 2.30 to 4.30, they would have the opportunity to pick one of five different options um, of afternoon programming, which is so great. So there's a, there's a marine science option. And they do some snorkeling. And, and um, you know, they, they have a really great time um, spending most of their time along the ocean. Um, we also have a sea kayaking and paddle boarding option. They're out sea kayaking every day. Um, we have a visual arts option with all kinds of 2D, 3D media art. We have a digital photography option. And we also have a health and fitness option where students um, can be doing a lot of CrossFit and working out and getting ready for their fall season if they are an athlete and they, they want to be working out this summer. So they would pick one of those five options and do an extended day program if they would like to. And that's our summer program. We usually have between 40 and 50 students attending for summer. Um, and usually 15 or so of the students that are attending for summer are going to be new for the school year. And they're using the summer program as a way to transition in, meet some students ahead of time, um, get to know their academic advisor ahead of time, and just kind of get used to the structure at Landmark. Um, the other Two-thirds of the students that attend for summer might be students who, you know, are doing maybe okay where they are but could really use a boost over the summer for some study skills, essay writing skills to take back with them wherever they return for the school year. Um, and, and that's it. So I, I think I got through most of the information. I'm sure there are going to be other questions, and this is going to be um, a great time. Um, an opportunity to start asking questions from some of our administrators and then our student panel. Thanks, Melody. <laughs> it is, it's a lot to digest. Um, so we'll take the um, transition now to the panel um, and learn a little bit more from a number of administrators who have joined us on the call. So I'll let them each introduce themselves and then we'd love to um, field any questions. So we'll start with our headmaster, Bob Bruto. Thanks, Katie. And thank you, Mel, for that really comprehensive overview of our school. Welcome, everybody. I'm really here just to welcome you this morning um, and to say to you that the way I see Landmark is it's a true community. It's a community that cares about its students. It's student focused. Uh, many of us have been here a very long time. I've been here since Landmark opened in 1971. You'll hear from others a lot of uh, years here. And many, many, many times people say to me, why is Landmark unique? What's different? And I think what's really different here is that we see each and every student as a total individual learner so that the diagnostic prescriptive approach of knowing how a student learns, 
knowing that student's strengths, knowing their challenges in the process, and then designing a program specifically for that student in the one-to-one -one tutorial and in class groupings, that really does make Landmark unique and it puts each student right at the center of the program, academically, socially, residentially, all of it. So I just want you to know that I'm always available. If there's ever a question you have, if you want to contact me, email, phone call, I'd be happy to, to answer questions as well as on this panel. And thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for joining, Bob. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Bill Barrett, the head of the high school. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for taking the time to be here. Um, as Katie mentioned, my name is Bill Barrett. This is my sixth year as head of the high school, but my 25th year at Landmark School. And I, I started at Landmark, like many people, as a full-time teacher. I lived in the dorms. I, I've coached and, and sort of grew up professionally and, and personally here. Uh, my wife, Christine, is a department head. It's also her 25th year. Um, we have three sons. Our youngest is in high school, so we're still flexing those high school muscles last time around. Uh, but one of our sons actually went to Landmark for two years. So, so I feel like as, you know, as we think about the questions that you may have, I know my answers often come as a professional, but also as a, as a parent, um, seeing what the school did for, for my own child. And, and, and I'll mention too that um, I teach a class, all the administrators at the high school, we, we teach in the classroom as well um, for at least one period a day, because I feel like that guides our decisions and, and also what we have to say in, in meetings like this. So thank you again for being here. It's, it's great to have you. Thanks, Bill. Next, I'd like to introduce John Fierick. Hi, everybody. So nice to be here. Um, this year, I'm serving as our interim academic dean at the high school. I arrived in 1996 uh, at Landmark, um, started off as a language arts teacher, uh, coached sports, lived in the dorms. I was a house parent for a little while. Um, for the last nine years, I was our public school liaison at, at the high school campus as well. So um, really just happy that you're here and willing to kind of talk a little bit more about what you need to know about our program. Happy to see you. Thanks, John. And finally, Rob Genitelli, Dean of Students. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Katie. As Katie said, I'm the Dean of Students here at the high school campus. I'm also in my 25th year as the Dean. I live on campus uh, in housing uh, with my wife and two children, although they're both uh, grown and gone now. So uh, our perspective as a family is uh, living in the community uh, for 25 years. Uh, the joke in my household is when I first got here, I told my wife we'd be here three, maybe four years max. Um, and now 25 years later, we're still living on campus and uh, living uh, and enjoying the uh, student life areas. So happy to help with any questions you might have as well. Thanks, Rob. All right, families. So we have about 10 minutes before our student panelists join. So this is a great time. Any questions you have um, for the administrative team who has joined us today? Um, and then we'll shift gears and hear more so from the student perspective. Um, Sandy's first question, Mel, you might be able to answer this in speaking to admissions. Do you want to tackle that? New students? Can you? Oh, no, there you go. Okay. And I just need to, what's the question specifically, Katie? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. So the, how many new students in each grade? Oh, okay. Yep. On average. Yeah. So, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, our, our high school is anywhere from, you know, we've had years of 275 up to 315, you know, so we're in that realm. And, you know, usually our ninth grade class is somewhere around 60 or so students. And, and I would say each of the grades, you know, similar builds a little bit more as we go up in grades. A typical graduating class for us is anywhere from 75 to 85 students usually. Um, so it's, it's fairly evenly distributed, I think, throughout the grades. Um, I don't know if you know, either Bill or John has any more specific details in terms of exact numbers per grade, but it's it's pretty even throughout the four grades. And I think junior, senior year, maybe a bit more because again, a graduating class might be around 75, 80 students. Sandy, yeah, comment. Just, oh, go ahead, Bill. This year, I think we have 72. Last year, we were up around 90. So there can be, can be fluctuation, but I think Mel, the, the averages you pointed out are accurate. Yeah. yeah. 
And we don't fill to uh, any caps for individual grades. So when families are calling the admissions office, they're often wondering, do you have any more spots for 10th graders? Because as Mel said, we're grouping students based on their skill level, not by grade. So therefore, we have a lot of flexibility in um, enrolling students. So that's why it varies from year to year. Um, Rob, on your data, wow. <laughs> so the boy to girl ratio, uh, currently 109 to 161. And I think that that's, seems fairly representative. We, we always tend to be a little bit higher with um, the males on campus. Good questions. Keep them coming, please. Here we go. Um, uh, oh, this is a good one. Uh, maybe John, you can tackle this. When a student's admitted in ninth, do you expect them to stay for all four years? Do some students build enough skills to return to their home school? Put on your public school liaison hat. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the hats. Uh, so let me. I'm just rereading the question very very quickly. So. Um, really, it, it depends on the individual student. So we, we really assess, I think, with, you know, on the way in with our admissions department, we see where, where those gaps are, identify the needs, continually monitor progress. And, and you know, we have had students stay for a short time, achieve some significant remediation and progress, and, and be ready for a, a step back uh, into, into either another private school, a less restrictive private school, or maybe even back home. So we have had students that have also stayed all four years as well. They continue to need the, the, the structure and remediation and scaffolding that we provide. Um, so it really depends on that individual student, where they are in their journey, where they are with their progress. Um, so yes, you know, we, we are always kind of continually looking to make sure that we are um, giving the best advice as to where, where that next step should be, whether that's to continue with us or whether they're now you know, ready for something else on, on their journey. And, and it just, it really always comes back to their individual needs. Um, Can I tag something onto that, John, too? I just absolutely. wanted to add, which is, you know, I think for some of the students, um, this becomes their high school, you know, their friends are here, um, they've become so involved with the community. And so for a lot of the students, they want to stay. And that's why earlier on, when I was going through the slides and mentioning the different level of programming, we have that flexibility for students to shift from whether they start off maybe in expressive language or founders, and then if they might be ready to transition into the prep, we can always provide the right level of challenge for them as they do gain skills and make progress if they do want to remain at Landmark um, to make sure that we're offering, you know, again, continued challenge and, you know, we don't, it's not like, okay, they've achieved a certain level and we can't offer them any, any continued um, challenge. So a lot of the kids want to stay. Katie, can I add to that too? Because Beth, it's, it's a great question and I almost view it as like, that's a question that, you know, you look at it through the parent's eyes and you also look at it through the child's eyes. And I'm, I'm just gonna add on to what Melody said, because often parents, that question is, you know, what skills is my child gonna gain? What are they gonna learn? Self-confidence in the classroom, out of the classroom, things like that. And then students often, they wanna know like, what's my high school gonna be like? What sports am I gonna play? What activities am I gonna be involved in? So I think Melody, you're absolutely correct in, in terms of certain kids, may have hit that skill threshold junior year where, yes, they, they could think about returning to their public school. They, they could think about another school, but they're the captain of a sports team, you know, or they love, you know, the, the roommate that they live with in, in the dormitory and the community nights and things like that. You know, um, they're connected with their tutor, with their classroom teachers, things like that. So it, it's very much, and, and we often talk about, talk about the fact that this is a real high school. You know, we are, yes, we are working on skills. We are using a diagnostic prescriptive approach with, with our students, but some of those things are invisible to our students in a sense, like they, they realize it, but I think when they come home to talk to their parents, they're, they're not talking about the, the remedial approach in their classes and their tutorials. You know, they're, they're talking about the fact that they might try out for the play or they're talking about prom you know, that's, that's coming up or senior trip, things, things like that. So I, I think it's just, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up Mel and, and John, you, you spoke real well, really well to the skill piece. So it's, so it's all of those things wrapped inside of, you know, an actual real high school with a thriving day and residential program. So I, I just wanted to point that out. Great. 
And it, it kind of leads nicely into Anne's question um, about uh, our assessments. Um, you know, as Melody explained, it's really critical that um, initial assessment that's done at the end of the admissions process, because that's when we're determining how to program and schedule for your student. Um, but perhaps, John, you can talk about some of more of the assessment that's happening um, throughout the school year. Sure, sure. And as, as Bill mentioned, it, it really comes down to that diagnostic and prescriptive approach. It starts in that admissions process, but then it continues when the student is enrolled and in, in, in moving forward in their classes. So partially, yes, the tutor is involved in that process, but that's with the guidance of an assigned academic advisor as well. So the academic advisor will lead the tutor through that diagnostic and prescriptive process of figuring, figuring out specifically through informal and formal assessment review what those gaps are, and then prescribe individually what they're going to be doing one-on-one -on -one all year for the curriculum for that particular tutorial. Um, and that isn't isolated to the tutorial either. There are diagnostic processes within all of the departments and all of the academic areas where at the beginning of the year, teachers in concert with their department heads are, are assessing those gaps, assessing the needs within those small groups, and then prescribing as they move forward in tandem with the curriculum, what are the skills that these students need and how are we going to individualize for these classes moving ahead? It's, and it's shared with you really um, on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, there's Parents Day in the fall um, and Parents Day in the spring, a full day event, um, as well as quarterly reports that you're receiving with really significant narratives listed out. So, um, Sandy, a great question for Rob Genitelli. Do you want to speak about orientation, Rob? Absolutely. So, Sandy, we do orientation for all students, uh, so not just for new boarders. So we do orientation for all new students to the high school, both those that are within the residential program and those that are day. And then we do an entire community orientation over the first week of the program to support the integration for all students to come across all divisions of the school and create opportunities for socialization and meeting friends. Specific for the residential students, that orientation is slightly different because they live here. So there are more logistics and more systems that need to go through. So students are, are through the housing process. I spend time to create housing for students. I'm the only one that does it. It's about an 80 or 90 hour endeavor to review all the files, create profiles, begin to match students together, houses together. And once those houses are created, then the house has its own orientation. Uh, Pre-COVID world, we would go away for residential orientation up to uh, camp in New Hampshire. Uh, with the protocols and the uncertainty, we're gonna base on campus this year but the orientation will still be the same. Each house will spend time as a collective unit to go through systems, policies, expectations, set examples of what they want in their house, what they don't want a house, orient to each other as residents and to the adults that live in the building, uh, the adults that work in the building, and then we will create those opportunities through the whole campus to make sure that the community spends time in orientation together so they know each other and are familiar with the systems and the programs. Great. We'll get to one more question and then I'll introduce the students. Um, John, this is a good one for you. Sorry, you're <laughs> getting a lot of action this morning. Do we use um, online reading and language programs? So short answer is not primarily. I think we have had students, again, it's all individualized. So we have had students that maybe in their within their tutorial, um, I do know of some students where Lexio was introduced and used as a supplement to, to our program. But primarily the remediation is, is not gonna be using an online program or assistive technology um, at the beginning. Certainly we can layer in assistive technology as we move through the process when we feel that's, that's an, an appropriate place to start. But the remediation is not at, at the outset going to include uh, a program like that. Um, oh, one more good question came in and then I'm going to switch to the students. Bill, how do we handle medications on campus? All of that, and, and Rob could probably chime in as well. All, all of that is done through our health center. We have a health center on campus. It's fully staffed um, and, and, and they work. Parents work with the nurses, with the director of our health center um, and medications flow through there. So the health center is open from 730 in the morning until 1030 at night. And the only medications that students are allowed to have in their possession in the room are those that are authorized by the health center. And those usually kind of move into the category like prescriptive 
facial creams or asthma related medicine, those, those pieces, but anything else that's a prescriptive nature uh, is housed and administered through the nurses in the health center. Great. So we're going to shift gears. Um, if you have more questions for our administrators, um, you know, we can certainly get you in touch with any of these gentlemen. Um, but I want to um, take a moment to let our students introduce themselves. Um, students, thank you for giving up your milk break to share with prospective families your experiences here at Landmark. So without further ado, I'll let Dominic introduce himself. Dominic, your name, where you're from, how long you've been at Landmark, um, and your some of the things you're involved in, please. Sure. Hi, I'm Dominic Pallini. This is my fifth year here at Landmark. I'm a senior. I do portfolio for arts and I do cross country and track. And Where are you from, Dominic? Oh, Boston, Massachusetts. Great. And Dominic, you've been both a day student and a resident, correct? That's correct. Great. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no worries. Ethan, would you like to say hello? Yes. Um, hello, my name is Ethan. I'm from Acton, Mass. Um, I am currently a senior. This is my fourth year at Landmark. Um, I've, I've been a part of a few different uh, activities on campus, um, ranging everything from performing arts to uh, the wrestling and sailing teams to multiple different clubs and student organizations, um, student council, intercultural club. I've been a part of all of them. I also came from Carroll too. So if there's any families that um, yeah. came from Carroll, I know that experience and know the different things from that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for joining me then. Um, we've got a few girls who will be joining the call soon, but while we wait for them, do you guys want to share if you know your plans for next year? Sure. Um, so for next year, I'm going to Pratt Institute of Arts in Brooklyn studying in photography and also running uh, for Pratt in cross country and track. Yay, Dominic, that's so exciting. Does it feel good to have it solidified? It's really good, it's nice. Um, it's really nice having a proper program to help seniors to transition into high school to college, wondering and helping to figure out what you want, what you need and where. And also it starts much earlier also in your junior year. So it's a little bit easier <laughs> over the years. Congrats, we're excited for you. Thank you. Ethan, do you know what your plans are? Yes, so I am currently deciding between um, American University and George Washington University down in DC um, and kind of grappling between those two, but I'm most likely gonna study uh, economics um, and possibly international relations. We'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, definitely it's been very helpful transitioning and, you know, the application process. I applied to like 14 schools, so they were very accommodating in that process. Don't apply to that many schools, but um, it, they were very, uh, the guidance department was very helpful with transitioning that. I kind of echo what Tom was saying. I'm glad you're ending up in DC, Ethan. I, I have a good visual of you from getting to do the DC trip with you last spring. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun. I did really like it and going there and seeing it, that that definitely, I love it. You carried my children around the majority yes. of the city on your I, I, There's like so many pictures of me as like with Ty and then Cora on, yeah. <laughs> I love that, that was a lot of fun. Good trip. All right, Allie just joined. Allie, would you mind introducing yourself and saying um, your name, where you're from, um, how long you've been at Landmark, and some of the things you've been involved in, please? Hi, I'm Allie. Um, this is my third year at Landmark, Birmingham, Massachusetts. So it's about an hour away from Landmark. Um, I do soccer here. Cross. I do a lot of community service. I was a boarder for about two years. Um, yeah, I just try to get into the community as much as possible, I'd say. Thanks for being here, Allie. Where are you on campus right now? I'm actually in the cafeteria. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining us. Um, oh, Kiara's here. Kiara, can you say good morning? Hi, I'm Kira. 
I'm a junior. It's my seventh year, and I'm involved in a like student council and a few other clubs, and I play volleyball in normal years. And did you say where you're from? I didn't. Sorry. I'm from Needham, Massachusetts, so it's like about an hour, and I have been a day student my whole time here. Thanks for joining us. And our last student panelist, but not least, Violet. Good morning. Violet? Violet, and we'll come back to you. <laughs> You're still muted. All right, families, what questions do you have for our students? We've got a nice range of students um, with a variety of experiences, and I know they'll be happy to candidly talk about their experiences. So please pepper them with, with questions. And Violet, if you're if you resolve your technical dis difficulties, jump in at any point to introduce yourself. Or leave. <laughs> Can I ask maybe for each of you guys to just maybe quickly mention like when you first came to Landmark, your thoughts about coming here? Like, were you on board? Were you excited? Or was it more like, oh, I don't know. I don't really think I want to go. And then like how quickly you felt like you adjusted once you got here? Ethan, why don't you go first and tell the truth about that? Yeah, so uh, Mr. G does gives a good point. I did not want to come to Landmark. I came here kicking and screaming, hated it. It was the last decision. I really, really, really did not want to come here. I was like, my parents were like, no, you're coming. When I came from Carroll, I looked at the different schools. I wanted to go to those schools. This is the last list. I really didn't want it. Um, but after being for, here for like a while, um, yeah, <laughs> after being here for a little bit and like really, you know, being in the border program, getting connected, you know, becoming kind of like a real part of the landmark family and especially being in when I lived here it was really very helpful acclimating and I knew people from Carol that were here so that was really helpful too um and yeah <laughs> and um it was just really over time I really came to love it here and you know this has become like definitely a second home so it's definitely changed dramatically over the years um yeah and one thing I would say that would help boost that and when you come in, join organizations. You know, we have so many different clubs uh, and sports. You know, join the wrestling team because that's the best team. Um, but that's the size of the point. I see Dominic over there with the track. Well, um, but you can also do, like, different, um, you know, plays and theaters. I've done all of it. It's fantastic. Um, uh, Ethan, I, Ethan, I have another question. I want an honest yeah. answer. If you and I have a spontaneous foot race down the hill, who wins? <laughs> I uh, last time I checked, I thought I did. Uh, come on. <laughs> no, I thought last time when we raced, I thought I did. But uh, not sure, Mister Bruno. I have that on film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we gotta check the check the tapes. Okay. Allie, did you want to add something about the transition? I would totally agree with Ethan. I was the same way. Like I came from a school of like 2000 kids and like no teachers helped me. I would just kind of like be pushed along and stuff. And I really did not want to come here. I didn't talk to anyone, like a single person for three weeks. I was, and then I finally like warmed up, realized that I'm going to be here. So like start making friends and everyone's just like super nice and stuff. And I joined soccer and that's how I mostly met a lot of my friends. And even at lunch, if you just say lunch with people, like it's just super easy to just sit down and have a conversation. Great. And now you're all in. It's awesome. Uh, Violet, I'm glad you're back. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Violet. Um, I'm a senior and I'm going to Landmark for four years. And this is my last year. 
And um, three, what else should we say? Where are you from, Violet? Oh, I'm from Wellesley, Massachusetts. Yeah. And do you know your plan for next year? I do. I'm going to High Point University in North Carolina. Yay, Violet. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited for you seniors. Great. Uh, Violet, how do you feel like you made friends at Landmark? How, how were you able to meet people? Um, since I'm a day student, it's kind of hard to stay involved and stay after school. But I think I'm in the prep program, um, which is sort of like a more fast paced, like college prep kind of environment. Um, and we're just really tight knit community. And I'm just, I've been in the same class with the same people for four years. And I've really been close with them. Um, you just form automatically a really close connection. So I think I've just through classes and now that I'm commuting um, and driving myself this year, I think I can stay more often up at school and be more involved with extracurriculars. And for this year, we have virtual and in-person um, activities. So I'm a part of like after school yoga um, and like all these virtual activities like intercultural club and uncomfortable conversations and faith and spirituality. So I've definitely met some really interesting and lovely people through those virtual activities. That's great. Thanks, Violet. Um, uh, families, our students have um, about five minutes before they're supposed to head to third period. So if there's any um, uh, other questions, I know these guys would be happy to address or I know there's a couple of students on the call. We always, you get a bonus point if you're a student and ask a question of the student panelists. Ethan, there was a question uh, from a parent about how long you were at Carroll School. How many years were you at Carroll before you transitioned to us? I was at Carroll from fourth grade to eighth grade. So math, that's like five-ish years, right? Four or five years? Yeah, about, depending on, yeah. Um, it was one thing I will add from Carol to Landmark is there's differences and similarities with between the two. Um, and one of the things that I really liked about the transition between Landmark and Carol is both teachers and students want to actually help you <laughs> and they are comfortable with, you know, they know about the um, dyslexia, they know about your learning disabilities and they actually want to and are well trained to help you and they really that was a very clear thing between the two there are different things between like the way they're going about it but the passion for helping and the actual transition was pretty easy between the two it was actually kind of smooth um and i know a lot of people that come from you know landmark that uh, that were from carol and like when I stepped on campus, I knew I had like four or five different people. I've been in the same class with someone since like fourth grade. You know, it's like that 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 kind of transition was really nice. There's a good question about note taking. Uh, if anyone feels like they they can speak to how that's yeah, I like go ahead. Um, yeah, so the prep program is also specialized for kids that have executive functioning deficit, and I have. Kind of like a severe case and i really benefit from listening like actively listening when when the teacher is talking and then later that night or just in class i will take notes and we have all these different layouts like two column notes margin noting highlighting um and maybe like voice to text typing so there are many ways that students can you know get the information Great. And another good question was, how do you feel like new students are welcomed into the community? Um, so I like have personal experience about that. Like one of my best friends came in sophomore year, just in the middle of the year. And I feel like everyone at Landmark just like kind of knows if a new student is coming or if they're a new student and they kind of just really welcome them. And especially like 
if a group of friends like really know a student like a new students coming in they'll usually go together and go introduce themselves to the new student and like include them and stuff which i think is really nice and friendly and it's not like overwhelming or anything thanks one thing I, well one thing i would have about like new students is like when you're especially coming in like you know living on campus and like residents you really become like a second family because we start you know when we first um start we go up to like new hampshire and it's like a week-long kind of like summer camp where it's just like in your dorm and you become really close with your dorm um you know like you also become you know close with the faculty there you know like important like friends like you know mr mead and like mr roberts and all those different people and with your with different especially when you're like new and freshman you are with totally new kids too so there isn't that you know kind of like oh people already have those like friend groups it's not very like clicky here at landmark it's very open and a lot of kind of ebbs and flows between the two so it's really not like that what do you i might have something to add to um like the comment on note taking if that's okay so yeah, i'm not in the prep program i'm uh in the founders and last year i had to take a study skills class and i know like i viewed myself because i had been here for so long as a good note taker since it's kind of drilled into you like all the different methods that violet mentioned but the i would recommend if you have it in your schedule take a study skills class because it's even if you don't think you need it, they teach you all the different ways to take notes, all the different ways of organization, whatever executive functioning, like things you need to improve on. I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you for saying that. A lot of times it's just skills that aren't usually taught, um, especially at the high school level. Um, yeah. Um, students, you guys are rock stars as always. Um, I want to let you guys get to third period, but um, on behalf of the families on the call, thank you so much for giving up your, your free time um, to talk about your experiences and um, congrats to the, the seniors and good luck with spring sports and activities. Um, you guys are great. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you guys so much. Thank you. And thank you to the administrators for um, sharing your time with us as well. I know it's a busy morning and campus is really gearing up for spring. So thank you. Um, and again, families, if you want to get in touch with any of the, the, um, the, the people on the call, we're happy to have the admissions office put you in touch. Yeah, contact our admission office first and then we can put you directly in touch with anybody that you might need to speak with. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. Good to see everyone. And Allie was right. She that girl spent three weeks here and did not speak to a single person. It's <laughs> <laughs> all kind of protest or not be here. Um, and we tried everything. I remember that. And her mom would call me every day, thinking, "Has she talked to anyone yet?" I'm like, uh, "Nope." But she's like <laughs> going to class and she's going to lunch and she's being polite, and respectful. Uh, and it once the kind of the dam broke and she just kind of resolved the place that she was going to be here. She's been pretty much a rock star ever since. Um, but I'm glad that she said that because I remember that time too. Yeah. It, it's amazing that she's here on this call right now, thinking <laughs> thinking back to that. And and Rob, listening to Allie in the calf reminds me one of us should get over there. It sounded kind of loud over there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say just from the admission office standpoint too, of talking with, you know, being the one to interview and accept new students to the school. There, there's always some that are reluctant and really anxious, nervous, um, that's common, and, and some that are really not feeling super positive about it. But I would say, just to put it in perspective, the larger majority of the kids are very excited. I can think of the students that I've met with so far this year, and I've had a lot of huge smiles when I've told them they're accepted, and when I ask them the question, you know, how do they feel about the idea of coming here, 
most of the students are saying, oh, this is my top choice, or this is where I really want to go, or this is where I know I need to go, it's going to help me the most. And um, so many, many, many students are very much on board and wanting to come and excited to come. So, uh, but yes, there are certainly some that <laughs> have reservations or concerns about it. So. Thank you families so much for taking the time to learn more about Landmark and um, from the admissions office, please reach out if you have any questions as you digest all of this information. Um, we're happy to stay in touch with you. So, yeah. Michelle, I think we've been caught in a time loop because your child really grew up quickly in front of us. <laughs> my child, my child gracefully exited stage left and got replaced by my husband who's off screen. <laughs> Funny. Yes. <laughs> but just one question. When so we filled out the paperwork, when might we hear back or what's the process for admissions? Yeah, and I can I can mention that. I actually think um I have, yes, <laughs> your son's application with me. So um I think you were alerted once it was complete and going out for our review process. Um bye administrators, thank you. And um so it's had we it goes through a couple different reviews one of our testers reads first and then we as an admission committee go do like a second review do any follow-up we need to so it's in that phase so i would say within a couple weeks um you'll be hearing about you know whether we're taking the next step to schedule a virtual screening and interview appointment that's kind of the final step in the process if we feel like we're likely to be a good fit okay mm -hmm. so soon <laughs> is the mm -hmm. answer and then yeah and we'll we'll schedule that um, yeah, so just know, you know, we work on a rolling basis and um, we're trying to, this is our very, very busy time, you know, March, April, May, um, and um, we're, we're working through things as quickly as possible, but it is typically about a month from the time we get a completed application before we've done the whole process, know if we're likely to be a good fit, and then again, we will reach out then and schedule a virtual screening and interview if we're feeling confident. If for any reason we feel like we're not the best fit, again, you'd get a call from either myself or Libby Park as our admission director, um, and we would be explaining why, and, and we, you know, we always try to make other program recommendations if Landmark isn't the right fit for whatever reason, um, so we don't just send you an email, sorry, no, it's, <laughs> we really try to, you know, talk to you about that. Um, but like I said, if we're feeling like, you know, there's a good possibility, then we will take that step of scheduling the virtual screening and interview appointment. Okay. Um, and it's, yeah, for those of you who haven't applied yet, if anybody hasn't gotten us um, applications, just know, you know, we're still, we still have space, we're still processing, but the quicker you can get us all of the information, the better. Are you doing virtual uh, uh, in-person tours as well? Or is this the, the preferred protocol at this point? Yeah, so for accepted students, once we've accepted a student, if they would like to schedule the family and, and the student a time to come to campus and take a tour on campus, we can set that up, but we're reserving that. Like in the past, you know, in the pandemic <laughs> world, obviously we'd have these group visits and be doing group tours and taking you into buildings and all of that. Um, and, and because of just, again, safety protocols and trying to, um, you know, minimize extra people being on campus. We're just doing it for accepted students. Um, unless, you know, some exception, if we had a family from very, very far away, like, oh, someone's flying in from California and they're visiting multiple schools. And so we would at least in those situations ask for some testing ahead of time to be able to preview whether it looks like we could be a good fit. Um, because we hate to set up, a you know, show a student around and get them excited about something if we're not the right placement. Um, so, so yeah, so we're doing that. The tours are outside only though. I do want to just mention, we can't take folks into buildings at this point. So it's just, you know, showing you around Rob Genitelli who joined us today. He's been doing most of the, the tours. So Thank you. Thank you guys so much for joining us today though. We really appreciate you taking the time. And like Katie said, any questions reach out anytime and um, you'll get a recording of this within a couple of days. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful.